Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Boone County in Kentucky, I lived in Arbor Glen Estate in Richwood. Back then, it was a relatively new subdivision, and our home backed up to a wooded area. My sighting was in the middle of the day. I was walking my dog, Charlie, in the backyard, and all of a sudden, she stopped. I looked around and took note of the fence line, right where she was looking and growling. It was straight in front of us. The Bigfoot was about 50 feet in front of me, on the other side of the fence line. We stared at each other for a few minutes. I had such a hold on Charlie's leash. After a few minutes of looking at one another, he turned and ran away. As soon as he turned, I turned, grabbed the dog, and made a run for the house. I looked back just as I was almost in the house, and he was gone. I distinctly remember the creature. He was tall, over six feet high. He was an off-white color with fur that dangled a bit, maybe three to five inches in spots. The face was a mix between human and primate. Not an ape, not a human dressed up. My father has also seen it off Shady Lane in Crittenden, Kentucky, near a creek bed. Later that night, I overheard him telling my mother about it. Crazy thing is, we seem to have seen the same type of creature. Both of our sightings were tall creatures and off-white. That area was back on Shady Lane by the bridge. Tons of people used to dump trash there, and there was a creek bottom. Not the best for the environment, I know. My dad saw him in the creek bottom. It was the middle of the day, clear and warm. On to the next one. In Lawrence County in Kentucky, a few years ago, my cousin and I were outside and heard very loud noises. I've hunted, camped all my life. I've heard many animals, calls, I've heard them all. These noises were very loud and high-pitched. Until recently, I've always wondered what these noises were. I was watching a Bigfoot show. They were audio taping trails where Bigfoot was sighted. I was shocked when they played these tapes. They sounded exactly the same. An experience like this will really wake you up. This is no bull. People laugh, make jokes, but it's true. We did not find anything. It was dark and hard to tell in what direction the noise was coming from. We looked around the next day and didn't find any sign on the ground or in the trees. It's not a mystery to me anymore. I know the truth. We had been sitting outside talking. It was about 9.30 p.m., this happened in a wooded cow pasture that has a creek through it. The cow pasture has high banks. On to the next one. In Hopkins, Kentucky, in an area called Lonesome Woods near Highway 800, three friends and myself were camping out the night before the opening morning of deer season in November, to be exact. We had set up camp in an area known as Lonesome Woods, which covers about three counties. It was really cold, and we had a really big fire going, and we were all sitting around it to stay warm, when all of a sudden, this weird moaning sound filled the woods. It sounded kind of like a siren, except it was very loud. It let off a series of three moans, starting low building and then dropping pitch as well as volume in three births. This scared us because we all grew up in this area and have hunted and camped out here all of our lives and have never heard such a cry. Not wanting to act scared, we tried to laugh it off, but an unsteady feeling lingered throughout the camp for a while. That happened at about nine. At 10.30, 
one of my friends who was camping with us stepped out into the woods to relieve himself. He wasn't gone for about 10 minutes when he came running back to the camp saying, I'm gone, and if you all have any sense, you'd leave too. We asked him what was wrong, and he told us he had seen something down by the creek located on the other side of the hill. It stood about eight feet tall and appeared to be drinking from the stream as he came across the hill. Once on top of the hill, he took notice of him, stood up, and watched him. Or, as he said, watched me run. He hadn't much more than got the words out of his mouth when we heard something running through the brush on top of a hill. My brother had a mining light, plus it was very bright from the moon that night. The sky was spotless, so my brother shined his light up on the hill to see a silhouette of a very large creature running on top of the hill. We couldn't make out color, but it was human-shaped with long arms and kind of ran hunched over. It looked to be about eight feet tall. The sound it produced while running was amazingly loud. It sounded as though a truck was being driven over a road of branches and twigs. This was enough for us. Scared out of our wits, we packed up what little we had and left. We have heard a lot of stories about this area, and now we believe them. There is something in those woods, without a doubt. The yell came while we were sitting around a fire, talking and staying warm. The first sighting was my friend who was just walking over the hill. The third, we were talking about what my friend had just witnessed. The site was hardwood forest mixed with swampy bottomland. The forest part is very hilly, but quickly gives way to swamp and bottomland. On to the next one. In Boone County in Kentucky, some friends of ours who live by the Ohio River in Constance, Kentucky, have been telling us about strange yowling from some large creature in the woods behind their house. Their description and the sounds and sounds I've heard of Bigfoot recordings online are very similar. The woman is very familiar with animals and she cannot tell what this animal might be. They've heard the thing crashing through the underbrush. To my knowledge, nobody in the area has seen anything or reported footprints, but the woods are on a steep hillside along the river. I have seen coyotes in northern Kentucky, and I know that bobcats, bears, and other large animals appear from time to time, so this could be a false alarm. On to the next one. In Greenup County in Kentucky, I lived in a hollow during this incident. It had one paved road and several gravel roads. All of the gravel roads are surrounded with trees. It was approximately 11 p.m. Me and a friend of mine were walking down a gravel road near my house. We observed a large object in the middle of the road, about 200 yards from our position. It looked similar to a large ball or something. My first thought was that it was maybe a tree stump or a large rock was in the middle of the road. Then I began to wonder how such a large object ended up in the road to begin with. We continued walking toward the object. Once we were within 100 yards of the thing, we observed this large, black creature rise up from a crouched position and face us. This thing had to have been at least eight feet tall. We could not make out any distinguishable features, but we did see that it was black and appeared to have fur that sort of glistened in the moonlight. When we saw this creature, we immediately froze. We were petrified and observed it for about 20 seconds. I believe it was looking at us, but I can't say for sure because it was so dark. After that, it turned and walked into the woods next to the road. After it walked into the woods, my friend and I turned around and ran pretty fast to get away from there. Once in a while, quite a few people, including myself, would hear strange howling sounds similar to recordings of Bigfoot I found online. My friend observed the creature. 
My neighbor said that one night he was standing at his kitchen sink and he glimpsed out of the window something that was as tall as him. The house he was in had a very high foundation, three cinder blocks above the ground, and he was six foot two himself, so that's pretty tall. It was approximately 11 p.m., very cold and clear night with a full moon. The wooded area is temperate, deciduous forest. A creek flows through the hollow where the incident occurred. On to the next one. At the Worth Ranch Scout Reservation near Possum Kingdom Lake, the primary witness was at a Boy Scout camp. He did not see much, but a white figure shooting behind a grove of trees on top of a nearby rocky ledge. The troop were camped near the river bottom. Then he saw two boys running down the hill shaking. They told him of a large humanoid white ape with long arms walking a cow trail. They said that it screamed like a woman and ran off when they made contact with it. There were local legends of an albino ape in the area. On to the next one. A couple of weeks before bow hunting deer season in Throckmorton County in Texas, this story I have never told anyone, except friends and family. I've been an outdoorsman all my life. A reptile hunter has always been one of my hobbies, so I can say when I'm out at night with my spotlight looking for snakes in the desert, along cuts, arroyos, or canyons, I have to make very sure what I am looking at because I could step on a rattler or a dangerous critter. This happened to me one night. A friend of mine had a deer leaf up by Throckmorton and wanted me and my brother-in-law to go with him to set up camp. Upon arrival, we went through the gate, picked a good spot in the clearing, and removed the trailer camper from his truck. We started a fire and had a few beers. After we all got our wind back, one of our friends said he was going to bed as he had to set up his feeders in the morning and scout for deer. Me and my brother-in-law decided to take the topographic maps and go explore the many ponds around to try to catch bullfrogs or see what we could find. The first pond had a few, but we decided to go to a bigger one down the trail a bit since we had maglite. Before we left camp, our friend warned us about the game warden seeing us using light out on the deer leaf. Anyhow, we started to walk to the other pond following the topographic maps that we had. We had gone about a quarter of a mile when we noticed something hiding behind a tree. Me and my in-law stopped, saying what the heck is that? At first, we thought it to be the game warden. We had our lights right on it, standing like a human looking around the tree at us. We decided to get a closer look. It didn't move. My in-law said, whistle at it. So I did. I whistled twice. <laughs> whistle, whistle. Upon that, it stepped right out in the road. We're talking a four-foot side step. I had seen some men before, but this was one strong one. I'm six foot. It was seven or a little more. It had heavy eyebrows and yellow eyes with red in them. The mid-body was short compared to the legs, which were long. The arms went down to the kneecap. It was covered in light hair, and on its head was gray hair. No hairy creature like you hear. This was one lean machine, like a cougar's. I mean, we were close enough. I could see the muscles on this man. Anyhow, it started to walk for us. It took about two or three steps. I mean, four footsteps, not a run, but in a walk. I told my in-law, I'm running. He was in shock at the thing. I hit him and turned and said, come on. He was running backwards with his light on it. I told him, come on. We made a quarter mile in seconds flat, knocking on our friend's camper door, wanting the gun, telling him this thing was right behind us. He wouldn't give it to us, 
saying we saw a deer or a cow and closed the door to the camper. Me and my in-law were sleeping by the fire that night, and we wanted to make sure it was gone. So I got a hoe and he got a bushwhacker and we went back to that area we thought to make sure it was gone. We saw no sight of it again, so we went back to camp. The next morning, we did the deer thing with our friend as he laughed at us the rest of the trip. My in-law won't even talk about it, not even to me. I know what I saw. I've seen cougar, badger, deer, and many others in the night with light. It was human looking. I wouldn't have shot it if I had a gun. It didn't want to hurt us, or it could have caught us easily. It seemed curious as we were of it. There was a noise, like a thumping or something. I can't explain. It was gone when we went back. It's been ten years or more, but I remember it like it was yesterday. I never reported it because I thought he should be left alone. There was some kind of banging or thumping sound, loud. We were looking for bullfrogs around ponds and exploring the area. The area is desert with ponds, rocky hills, and scrub trees. One lane dirt road, oil land, Chevron, I think, Brazos River, not many miles away. On to the next one. Near Karnak in Harrison County in Texas, my fiancé at the time and I were visiting my grandmother, who was in her mid-80s at the time. She was living on some property that had been owned by my family for over half a century. She had spent a good portion of her life on this property. It was dusk, and we were about to leave, so we decided to sit on her porch before leaving. After sitting on the porch and talking for a while, we heard a loud scream. It was coming from just inside the woods behind her house. I'm pretty familiar with animal sounds, but I couldn't identify this sound. I figured that since my grandmother lived there most of her life, she would know what it was like. I asked her about the sound, and she said that she didn't know, but she said that she takes all her scraps and garbage to the edge of the woods every evening, and lately she had the feeling that she was being watched. She also told me she had started carrying a garden hoe when she went out there. On to the next one. In Harrison County, near Caddo Lake, a deer hunter and a friend were hunting on family land and settled into their deer stand. The primary witness's stand was near a pipeline clearing. He sat there, freezing his butt off under the full moon. About an hour before sunrise, he noticed something coming out of the woods. It walked down the other side of the pipeline clearing towards him. He thought that it was another hunter, but he did not see a gun on him. He wondered why a person was walking without a gun on private property through the tree, vines, and briars that are really hard to walk through. The witness decided to click the safety off his gun, and as soon as he did this, though it was barely audible, the thing heard it and turned in his direction. Without missing a step, it was walking backward while looking at the witness. After about four steps backwards, it spun around, took a few more steps, and exited the pipeline clearing into the woods. The witness watched and saw a large tree shaking. This frightened him. He was done hunting, but too scared to leave his stand. He stayed in the tree stand until his friend showed up after sunrise. There was an animal path where the creature had traveled. On to the next one. Near Point Blank in San Juanito County in Texas, the six of us, my boyfriend, my children, and another couple and me stopped at a boat rental tourist trap on Lake Livingston. The guys we were with went in and rented two boats for a couple of hours while we waited outside. While on the lake, I felt like someone was watching me. I quickly turned around to look into the eyes of a large, black, hairy creature approximately eight or nine feet tall that was standing at the edge of the lake, 
right next to the water's edge, looking right back at me. Although I was staring right at the creature's face, I could barely see its eyes due to the extreme amount of hair. Its body was huge and block-like. For a few brief seconds, we stared at each other, and then suddenly the creature turned to its right and took one step and went crashing through the trees, which shook even the very tallest tree and sent the bird panicking into flight. Being stunned as to what I saw, I hesitated to tell the others of what I had seen. But I did tell the others and ask them to take me to where I had seen the ape-like creature and let me out to see if I could see any footprint. They too had heard the creature crashing through the tree and believed that I had seen something and wouldn't let me get out and search for evidence. I have previously known the site for explicit encounters. I was with my boyfriend and another couple with my two children. Although they did not see it, they heard it. It was 1 p.m. Sunny, clear, bright, but not blinding. The lake was surrounded by dense forest, swamp, with a mossy outer rim with falling trees. Notably dim interior of trees. I heard there were many encounters on the Trinity River, which empties into the lake. On to the next one. This happened almost exactly 14 years ago in Illinois. I'm fairly certain it was in spring because I remember it being around Easter time. I was driving home one evening and was about a few miles away from the nearest town by then, on a less frequented road that I usually took to get home. I was on my way when a figure began crossing the road in front of me. It was walking, but then it stopped in the road and turned to look at me. Since I was driving fast, I had to slam the brake even faster and came to a hard stop about 20 feet from it. I kept my eyes on it the whole time, though. It was clear enough, and there was still enough light that I could see a few details about it, but I was caught off guard by its size. It looked immense, maybe a whole 10 feet tall. Take the biggest football player or wrestler you know, and they'd be tiny if they were standing next to what I saw. It was covered head to toe in dark black hair, and its head went up high and ended in a sort of pointed shape. I stopped, and I was looking at it, when three other figures crossed the road behind it. That caught me off guard, too, because I didn't realize there was more than one. They looked similar to it, but weren't as big as it was, and it looked like the big one in front of me was at least a few feet taller than the smallest one among them. I think they were some sort of family unit. They crossed the road in a blur, and after they passed by, the big one didn't wait much longer or try to interact with me in any way. It just moved on too and continued on its way with the others. Since they could move that fast, I think they could have crossed the road before I even got to where they were. There was no need to stand in front of me and make me stop. I think they were probably just minding their own business and going wherever they were going, and maybe it was just a dad making sure the way was safe for his family. It's possible he didn't realize I would be there, but when he noticed that I was and then saw how quickly I was coming closer to where he was, he took that position on the road to protect his family. That's what I think, because otherwise, I don't know why he would have stopped me like that when they could move as quickly as they did. I watched them go. They crossed a field and disappeared into the heavy wood further beyond the field. They moved so quickly, and the whole thing happened so fast, that all of it from start to finish could probably have happened in half a minute or less. That was all. I never saw them again. On to the next one. Taylor and two friends left Bismarck, North Dakota, on a long planned vacation trip. The plan was to go to Los Angeles. From there, they would travel up the coastal highway to Seattle, then drive across country homeward. 
They'd been planning this trip for over a year and were excited to experience everything. At the end of their trip, Taylor said they had seen what they wanted to see. They were ready to conclude their trip. It was getting dark when they stopped at a small town outside Coeur d'Alene to find a camping spot. We stopped at the gas station and talked to the proprietor about our trip. He told us about a sweet camping site. He made it sound so cool, but it wasn't a big deal. We ended up taking a gravel road towards the river. He said they arrived at their camping spot and unpacked. They were tired but made a fire. They were almost out of wood, so Taylor took an axe into the woods to cut more wood. I went about 10 minutes from our camp and up an embankment where I saw a downed dead tree. I started to chop wood. I stood up after a little bit and felt some vertigo. I was lightheaded. I felt sick and the silence around me was very apparent. It became super quiet. I can't explain it. Everything felt weird, so eventually I sat down. His friends had joined him to haul the wood to the campsite. They mentioned there was no insect noises, but Taylor didn't notice until they said something about it. I'm sitting next to this tree, not feeling too hot, and the guys didn't feel safe. I stood up and grabbed the firewood while my buddy grabbed the axe. Out of nowhere, this log came hurtling toward us from an angle behind us. My buddy, Jared, said something threw that at us. We all grabbed the rest of the wood and left there pronto. It didn't feel right. As they were traveling out of that area at a high rate of speed, Taylor glanced back and saw a Bigfoot. It stepped out from behind a tree about 40 yards away, so Taylor got a good look at him. He was big, colossal really. He had dark brown hair and no specific facial features that stand out. He was about eight feet tall, as near as I can tell. He was not a man in a suit. It was fur. He was unnaturally tall and really fit. He seemed strong. Taylor turned to his two friends. They all decided at once to run. They left their axe where the deadfall tree was. So if anyone finds it, he would like it back. His friends, Mike and Jared, had differing opinions as to what they should do next. Mike was intrigued and Jared wasn't sure the experience was really happening as it felt so surreal. Eventually, they decided to stay where they were to see what would happen. Taylor stayed with them another 25 minutes when they started hearing fresh creaks and snaps coming from the nearby spring. I wanted to leave and told my friends to leave now. They cleaned up their campsite and drove into Coeur d'Alene to spend the night in a hotel. In retrospect, Taylor said there were numerous pieces of recall that stood out to him. He said when he was cutting the firewood, the memory that drew his attention was the absolute quiet. No birds or animal of any kind. The next item was the log that was thrown at them. It was about 15 to 20 feet long and the width of a dinner plate. The tree looked as though it had been ripped out of the ground and still had branches hanging from it. At this point, I don't think anything would surprise me. Taylor said, I was blown away by how big he was. Just huge. On to the next one. My name is Dustin Anderson, and my friend's name is Dustin Everdeen. We were riding our motorcycles one day, and we decided to stop and rest for a while. When we looked across the valley, we saw a large animal about six to seven feet tall with very wide shoulders and walking on two legs. We watched it get up, walk around on two feet and sit down on a nearby stump. We didn't go and check it out because if we just happened to meet it on our way and it got ballistic on us, we might have been in a little bit of trouble. So we got the heck out of there. There were no animals or game of any sort in that area. On to the next one. My brother-in-law and I were bow hunting in the Deschutes National Forest. There are endless amounts of dirt forest service roads throughout the central Oregon region. 
we would drive down these roads and find a promising spot to get out and walk the area. There are a lot of old fire areas, and we found one we had not been to before, and it was a burnt-out section of forest, approximately 1,500 acres in size. It was around 1 p.m., and we had no luck, so we decided to try one last place and then go home for the day. We parked and got out quietly, and I headed into the woods on the other side of the road, and I walked about a 100 feet in and was startled by a doe jumping out of the brush and fleeing. We decided to go in the direction that the doe had gone, thinking that there may be a buck somewhere nearby. My brother-in-law went off in the direction he thought the doe had gone, and I stayed back and looked for tracks to see if there were others. This is when I noticed some very strange prints on the ground. They were like a human footprint, but larger. There were about 8 to 12 prints by one creature as far as I could tell. The prints were not all in one direction. It looked as if the creature, animal, or whatever it may have been, had shifted its weight or something when it turned because the dirt was pushed up more on the outside of the print in places. I told my partner, and he didn't seem too interested. He just kept looking for the deer. Then he finally came back up over the little rise, and I showed him the track. He didn't seem to know what to think. I kept studying them and tried to come up with an answer for them. I thought maybe the wind, but know the chances of the wind making one, let alone eight to twelve of these prints, was very unlikely. Or a bear, but for a bear to be on its hind legs and to take that many steps, was very unlikely. The prints, from what I remember, were about 12 to 15 inches in size, and some of the strides were possibly 4 to 4 and a half feet. We had been at this location for about 30 minutes when my brother-in-law said we should go. He sounded kind of shaky, which was unusual for him. I asked him why, and he said we should go. So, this got me kind of spooked for the first duration of this half hour, so we got in the car and left. We never saw a creature or heard any unusual sound. Other than the print, the only thing that seemed odd to me was that when we first got to this location, it was very quiet. On to the next one. We took our horses into the country south and east of Teclima in Josephine County in Oregon. We weren't quite into California, but some were close. How I wish I had a camera and global positioning device. I am a retired investigator dealing with insurance fraud, and I don't really fall for anything that isn't black and white or plausible. It takes something quite extraordinary for me to be at a loss for an explanation. We had finished dinner and were smoking cigars and pipe tobacco when we heard a scream from somewhere above and behind us. I have never heard anything like it. And, quite honestly, it scared the heck out of us. I was with two friends who knew the outdoors well. I am not a hunter, but they are, and have been in the rough country for as long as I have been behind a desk. Neither of my friends could identify what we heard. It was quiet for about ten minutes, and we heard it again. It seemed like the source was lower than the first time we heard it, and it seemed louder. We heard nothing else, and hit the sack around 9 p.m. In the morning, my friend Jack came back to our camp after a little look and see, and said he had the feeling that he was being watched as he did his business in the brush. He said he heard footfalls fairly closely, but thought it was one of us. We had just gotten up and hadn't even made coffee. As we were about to go, we heard something moving quickly through the heavy scrub and up the hill. We could occasionally see brush and tree limbs moving, but couldn't make out who or what it was. Al, who moved to our left, said it looked like a man, but that it was too big and fast, and he only saw it for a second. He said the man seemed to be hairy, but it wasn't really light yet, and there was lots of interference. We followed and realized we could never make out the kind of time that it did, we smelled a horrible, musty stink, but never got a good glimpse of our visitor. What amazed my partners is that branches were broken about six feet up 
and the speed with which it moved. I still won't say the word Bigfoot, but I'm more of a believer now. On to the next one. This happened in Deschutes County in Oregon. What I heard on that late fall evening made the hair stand straight up. The month was September and the weather was warm. My husband had returned to Redmond to go bowling on his league. I stayed behind as some friends were to come up later that evening and join us. The state was doing a lot of road work and were blasting parts along the highway to clear space for wider road. I was putting more wood on the fire when I looked at my watch. Our friends were late as usual. It was 10.30 on a Friday. You could hear the trucks and the blasting going on along the road. Then there was a really loud blast. It shook the ground under the stump I was sitting on. Further away from the road, you could hear a rock slide started from the blast. Then the wood came to life. I could hear running of a very large animal going through everything in its way. Underbrush was snapping and small trees could be heard crashing to the ground. As the rocks in the canyon stopped sliding, the woods became quiet again. Then, just across the lake from where my tent was pitched, the howling and screaming started. These sounds went on for at least half an hour. I, being alone at this time, became rather unnerved and decided that my tent would be a better place to wait for my friends. I crawled inside and found my rifle, loaded a shell into the barrel, and sat there in the dark. The sounds across the lake had all but vanished. I could still hear something moving over there, and it wasn't deer, elk, bear, cougar, cattle, people, lynx, badger, wild dogs, or wolverine. At 11.30 p.m., my friends finally made it up to the camp. They could tell that something had made a very bad impression on me and asked what had happened. I told them. We waited till my mate got back from town, but no more noise was heard that night. The next day, my buddy asked me if there was a trail that they could walk around the lake. I told them yes, and then warned them to be careful as on the other side was where I had heard all the racket the night before. When the rock slide happened and scared something, when they returned from the walk, they said that the ground over there that wasn't too muddy had been covered with tracks about 19 inches long and 10 inches wide and sunk into the ground twice as deep as the tracks they had made. These were five toed tracks with no claw marks. They also said that several of the trees had the tops broken off at about the 10 foot line. Then the tops were stuck into the ground by the stump. One of my friends was a former sergeant of arms in the Vietnam War and spent a year over in Da Nang, he knew what he saw wasn't explainable. This was about five miles from Saddle Lake off Highway 58. This area was logged about five years before. On to the next one. For most of my life, my dream was to build and live in a tiny house. The idea of living in a beautiful location with a staggering view excited me more than anything else. So, in 2009, I decided to commit to my dream. Unfortunately, that dream would quickly morph into a nightmare. I'm originally from Seattle. I think it's a fantastic city. There is a lot that I appreciate about urban living, but there was also something so romantic about moving out to the country and waking up every day to nothing other than the sound of birds chirping. For about five years, I was disciplined with saving money that I'd used to build a tiny modern cabin. I had originally gotten the idea to purchase a tiny house because I worked for a marketing firm and one of our clients had a local company that designed and built them. When I was assigned to do their branding for this company, I found myself getting more and more immersed in the area in the idea of living in one of these creations. I was already going through a period where I wanted to downsize my number of belongings, so the idea of moving into one of those things aligned with my plan perfectly. Since the owner of the company, Colin, was very satisfied with how I had been promoting his business, he offered me a hefty discount to construct my home. At least when I was amid doing so, Washington wasn't nearly as strict as a lot of the other states when it comes to tiny house dwellings. While conducting research, it was sad to see how many state, 
towns, counties, etc. stood against tiny house living. I was surprised to see that California, a state that claims to be so environmentally progressive, was not very supportive of the tiny house movement. I didn't even have to do that much research when it came to the location of where I'd park my small structure. I was amazed at how affordable property was in Goldendale, Washington. I think I ended up purchasing half of an acre for just under $11,000. As soon as I saw the view that overlooked a dense cluster of giant pine trees, I knew I had to have it. Aside from a speedy internet connection, which I had to have for work, I planned on being off-grid. One of the best parts about working in marketing is that you can do most of it remotely. The only thing I would sometimes need to leave home for would be lunch or dinner meetings with clients. The first time I invited Colin out to see the property, we came across a pile of deer bone. The only reason I even knew it belonged to a deer was that the skull still had a good amount of the cartilage, including one of the ears. The strangest thing about the bone was how they had been pulled apart and were placed in a semi-neat pile, much like what humans do with a serving of chicken wings. But that wasn't even the strangest part. The strangest part was the extremely potent smell of urine. It seemed that whatever had stripped the meat from the bone had also decided to drench them with its scent. I remembered the smell being so strong it nearly made me gag. Colin did seem too fussed by the grotesque sight, insinuating that he had spent a lot of time out in nature and had seen far stranger things. I purchased the land in the winter of 2009, but didn't do much with it until later in spring. One of the many convenient aspects of tiny homes is that they can be built inside a warehouse and then driven to your property since they don't require a permanent foundation. When it finally came time to move in, two of Colin's employees were the ones to deliver the finished home to the property and make sure that everything was ready. Colin contacted me later that day to inform me that his workers were shaken up by a couple of terrifying screams. He wasn't mentioning it as a warning or anything like that. It was more like he found it humorous and was mocking his employees. But it was only a few days after I had moved into the new house that I began to question if there was something to be afraid of. I distinctly remember I was steeping a pot of fresh chamomile tea when I jumped at the most hair-raising scream. At first, I thought it was the sound of a woman getting stabbed with a butcher's knife, but then the same noise trailed off into a very animalistic holler, eliminating the spectrum that there was a human in need of help. Up through my teenage years, I was very passionate about wildlife, and the noise that I heard that night didn't resemble that of any animal I had heard before. It embarrasses me to say this, but it was that noise alone that already made me question whether it was smart to move up into the mountain. I felt like I had transformed back into a child. I wanted to get in bed, put the blanket over my head, and hope that whatever had made that awful noise went nowhere near my home. Having grown up in Washington, the idea of Sasquatch soon came to mind. The location was very desolate, and if I remember correctly, the closest neighbor was about half a mile away. What was I to do if some strange creature decided to break into my small house? I had heard numerous stories of Sasquatch encounters, but couldn't think of anywhere people were killed or even harmed, so that helped to calm my mind. I heard the same noise one more time that night, but it sounded much further off in the distance, making me believe that whatever was responsible wasn't too interested in me or my structure. A few days later, I awoke at dawn to another odd but quiet noise. It was the sound of something gently knocking at the outer wall of my tiny house. I had no clue what was going on. The only thing I could think that was possibly happening was that one of Colin's employees had returned to do a bit more work, but it had only just started to get light outside. I got out of bed and walked over to the kitchen window and saw something that still makes me shudder to this day. What I at first thought was a very dark-skinned man was crouched over at the side of my home and slowly banging his forehead into the outer wall.
Its body rocked back and forth. It was sort of like when someone jokingly bangs their head against the wall after having made a mistake, only this individual kept doing it, over and over. It wasn't long before I realized that what I thought was dark skin was actually very dark hair. The being was covered in greasy, matted hair. From the position it was in, I could only make out part of its profile, but the skin on its face appeared lighter, almost Caucasian color. Its cheekbones were very pronounced. That I could tell right away. People aren't kidding when they say the muscles on these creatures are beyond comprehension. They are so large, but also so lean. Its forearms would put Popeye to shame. As I continued to stare out the window, the being seemed to be oblivious that I was there observing it. Trust me, I wanted to get back into bed, but I was too frightened to move another muscle. I was worried that it would hear me and become startled and possibly even violent. It must have heard my heartbeat or something because suddenly it stopped smacking its forehead into the wall and instantly looked up at me. Its eyes were so wide like it was surprised to see me living inside my own home or something. Its eyeballs were pitch black and its mouth was full of yellow tinted crooked teeth. I didn't have to get a whiff to know that its breath was likely one of the most revolting things on the planet. After we stared back and forth at one another for what was likely just a few seconds, the creature suddenly hopped up onto the roof of my home. The way it jumped, it was like it took zero effort to hop up what I'm guessing was a good 12 or 13 feet. I could hear it moving about the roof as I continued to stand in the same place, wondering what I should do after seeing the size of that thing. I no longer felt safe inside my house. I knew that it could get inside with ease if it wanted to. A few seconds later, I heard it leap to the ground. When I peered out the window, the creature was maybe 20 feet away from my house and staring towards the wood. While it stood on two feet, its body swayed almost like it was deliberately doing some kind of goofy dance. It continued this motion until it defecated on my lot. This is extremely foul, but it was the largest mound of crap I had ever seen. It was pretty disgusting. I got the impression that it did this right in front of me as a way to declare dominance. The worst part about it was that it was only a few seconds until I began to smell the odor from inside of my house. It was the most rancid thing ever to contact my nostrils. I couldn't help but hurl into my sink. Since I experienced that, I've always wondered if it's the feces that people are smelling when they say these creatures are nearby, because I didn't smell anything at all until it used my lawn as a bathroom. Perhaps the creatures will often excrete when they sense that humans are in the area. Anyway, that was when I had hoped that things had gotten as bad as they were going to get, but that wasn't the case. On all fours, the creature began to head for the wood, but then it suddenly turned around and ran back towards the pile of excrement. It then proceeded to pick up a palm-sized glob and threw it at the side of my house, as if the odor wasn't already strong enough. While staring at my house, the creature performed the same swaying motion while shouting what sounded like words. If you've ever heard the Sierra sound, a recording by Al Berry and Ron Moorhead in the early 1970s, that was exactly what these noises sounded like. By this point, I had every reason to believe that the creature was making a statement that it didn't want me anywhere near that plot of land. I was so afraid that I couldn't think of anything else to do other than to hide and hope that the creature would wander off. Once all of the noise ceased, I gathered enough courage to run my car and drive into town. For those of you who have perhaps found yourself in similar situations, you'd likely agree that you're hit with what I'll describe as a wave of confusion. I was so desperate to report the experience to the authorities, but I knew there was close to no chance that I would be taken seriously. I remember I went and parked at the grocery store and took a breather. So many crazy thoughts were going through my head, and I wondered if it was wise to ever return to my property. At that time, my instincts told me that doing so could very well get me killed. After taking what was probably a 20-minute nap, I awoke to my cell phone ringing. 
It was Colin, and he had tried to reach out to ask how the house had been working out. He could immediately tell I was bothered by something. Since he asked, I didn't hesitate to tell him about what had happened. He asked my permission to see the excrement. I warned him about the danger, but ultimately said he was free to go out there at his own risk. I met Colin at the property about a couple of hours later and was devastated by the scene. A decent-sized tree looked as though it had just been ripped from the ground and had been swung at my tiny house repeatedly. Glass and material were scattered all over the place, making my tiny structure unlivable. Although the creature was nowhere in sight, there was more than enough evidence for Colin to see that I was dealing with something extremely abnormal. He knew that no human possessed the strength needed to swing a tree like a baseball bat. I remember how the entire time we were talking, we had to cover our noses from the smell of the creature's bodily waste. The guy was nice enough to wait with me until the police arrived. Of course, I have no way of verifying whether it was the truth, but the police officer claimed that he had lived in the state his entire life and had never seen a Sasquatch. The part that I found suspicious was how he didn't seem willing to admit that no human was capable of acts of that nature. It seemed like he was keen on filling out the report, avoiding in-depth discussion, and getting the heck out of there as efficiently as possible. However, maybe he was extremely frightened, but didn't want to admit it. I'll never know. After that whole experience, I saw no choice but to move back into an urban environment so I return to Seattle. For the most part, I keep my experience to myself as I know that it'll sound too ridiculous to even those who are interested in the topic. I felt a sense of relief after submitting this report because I'm confident that a few of the people who will hear it have had wild encounters of their own. Thank you to everyone who sends the report for narration. It's comforting to hear them. On to the next one. On Queen Street in Thunder Bay in Ontario, Canada, my sighting of suspicious tracks happened when I was about 11 years old. I remember it was a Sunday morning near noon. I was the first one out of the house and was on my way to the airport restaurant, which used to be our hangout when we were young. I was heading west on Queen Street and had just passed Diffins Avenue and crossed a large drainage ditch when I noticed these extraordinarily large footprints in the snow on my left. There was a vacant field there where we would play ball in the summer. Now it was covered with about six inches of snow. These footprints were about 18 inches long and seven inches wide with strides of nearly four feet long. The five toe prints on each foot were very clearly visible. They were headed in a southwesterly direction toward Rosslyn Road, bordered by the CNR railway tracks on the left and the airport on the right. Unfortunately, no one else was with me at the time. I thought of notifying the police or some other authority of the sighting, but since I was only 11 years old, I didn't think anyone would take my story seriously. About a year or two later, I heard of a similar sighting near a small community about 150 miles north of Thunder Bay called Armstrong, of something they called Bigfoot, on a news bulletin. This was the first time I had heard of such a thing called Bigfoot, and it brought back memories of what I had seen. Since that time, I have told many of my friends and relatives of this sighting, but never knew who to get a hold of to make an official documentation of the incident. I'm glad I now have that opportunity. I know what I saw and I believe. The incident happened near noon. It was a cool, clear day. These footprints were spotted in a field. I was the only one present. On to the next one. On the intersection of Route 12 and W Backline, at Barhead, west-south of Markdale, about two miles in Ontario. I was in my early teens riding in the back seat of our family car, coming from my dad's cousin's farm. Both of my parents were in the front seat. 
As we rounded a curve on the gravel road, the car headlights shone some lateral light sides. I was looking out the right rear window and saw something standing on the embankment at the tree line, a tall, fur-covered creature. The roadside embankment went up about 10 feet. As our car passed, I turned around to look out the rear window and the thing was now walking down the embankment and stopped and stood at the edge of the road. I could see it clearly in the brake light and some light coming from a lodge across as my dad slowed to a stop at a stop sign about 300 feet from the creature. I yelled at my parents to turn around, but they just doubted my sighting and drove on. It was at the closest, about 35 feet from the car. Note, I am 100% convinced that this was a Sasquatch for two reasons. Number one, no bear walks down an embankment on its hind legs. And two, few men are seven feet tall. And if it was a man in a monkey suit, why would he try to not be seen by us until we passed? A hoaxer would want to be seen. My dad used to swim in a pond as a child and told me some years later that he and his buddies would hear strange screams or growls in the woods where I saw it come from. The sighting was about 11 p.m. on a clear night from car brakes and light from a lodge across the road. At the time, there were no structures except the lodge. It was very woodsy. Now there are some houses and some fields with a few woods at that location. The ponds are nearby. On to the next one. A Lakeview trucker claimed to have seen a half-human, half-animal beast six to seven feet tall on a side of a road near Smithville. He estimated that the thing weighed 500 pounds. He went back to look for tracks, but found none. On to the next one. No less than seven people were reported to have called the provincial police to say that they had seen the monster, which all of them described as big, black, and furry. Wayne Beach said that the thing he saw a yard behind his car looked like a great big gorilla. Two 16-inch prints were reportedly found near a garage where Manfred Berg saw something he couldn't identify. Hector McDonald said he got a back view of the creature at night in his barn. Ontario Provincial Police downplayed the incident, saying, It's not a monster. There's no such thing as a beast, half human, half animal. Someone is playing a hoax. Suspicious. On to the next one. At Tilsonburg in Oxford County in Ontario in September, a Bigfoot was seen in a tobacco field by several people. 18-inch tracks were found. On to the next one. This happened in Ontario. I was 11 years old and staying at our old cottage on a Georgian Bay Island. It was a hot night and we slept with all the windows open. The smaller children slept in another room and had gone to bed earlier. It was about 10 p.m. when I went to bed alone in another room. My door was open. I lay on one side facing the door. About two minutes after my light went off, while I was listening to the adult six of them away, down the hallway in the family room, talking and telling jokes, I got the worst feeling of being watched from behind me where the windows were. I remember my heart began to pound because I was frightened. I wanted to run down the hall and get to the grown-ups. So I threw back the covers and whipped around to look at the windows as I got out of bed. There were three double casements, all standing wide open due to the heat. In the far left window between the sill and the open window pane was a large roundish head. I saw no features and there were no hands at the sill. However, I frightened it because it ducked down and banged its head hard on the open window. I heard it clearly. I ran out to get the grown-ups, but they told me I had been dreaming and to go back to bed. I made my dad close and lock all the windows. As an adult, I stand five and a half feet tall, and these windows were well above my head 
when I stand outside the cottage. You would have to be over six feet tall to peek in and stand on something or pull yourself up to fit your whole head into the open casement. I still go to this cottage. Sometimes I stay there alone with my kids. I cannot bring myself to sleep with the windows open on even the hottest night. Even if my husband is there, you have no idea how many times I have replayed this incident in my mind. I'm sorry I cannot produce more details about the head I saw. Every year when I pack for the cottage, I think of it and am made uneasy. About 10 p.m., it was very hot, very still and humid. Maybe three years ago at night, in July, my husband and I had just gone to bed when there was an awful cry out in the woods, like a cross between a coyote and a bird and a ghost, quite long and very loud, with several pitch changes. My husband, who grew up in a city, laughed and said he thought that would have scared the voyeurs as they sat around their fires at night. Well, I grew up in the countryside, and I know every animal and bird that lives northeast, and I have never heard the likes of that before or since. A few years back, I had just turned out my light in the back bedroom when something slammed into the side of the cottage hard. My 12-year-old son came running down the hall from the bunk room because he'd heard it too. Whatever it was hit the side of the house about midway along the hallway. I was scared to death alone with my kids in the dark, alone on an island. But I told him it was the siding contracting and making a noise, like the pipes when the heat turns on. All the doors in the cottage are glass and they don't lock, so I spent a horrible night. I refused to scare the kids and I let all of them wander all over. The island is part of the Canadian Shield. The whole area is rough or windswept granite shoreline covered with pine and oak forest. There were large areas of swale inside of the island. It is secluded enough to house deer, bear, grouse, bobcat, and mink, plus a huge number of reptiles and amphibians. The back of the cottage sticks out into the wood and has huckleberry bushes growing all around it and under the windows. It was quiet then, few boats on the lake at night with very few lights. On to the next one. My experience happened in British Columbia, Canada a few years ago. The town that I live is considered to be on the smaller side. If I'm too specific about myself, I think someone can recognize me easily and I'd like to avoid that occurring. I'd only be comfortable with going as far as to say it was in the southeast. It happened in the afternoon. I was hiking in the forest and heard calls from an animal that I didn't recognize. I was drawn to see what was making them and followed in their direction, but they stopped before I saw what they came from. I stayed a moment to try to listen for anything, but I noticed that everything was abnormally silent. I felt that something was nearby and was watching me. I didn't see anything right away, but I felt drawn to look up. When I did, I saw something that looked like an oversized primate. It was large, with reddish-brown hair, and was up in a tree looking down at me. It looked like it twitched slightly when I looked at it, like it understood it had been seen. As soon as it realized I saw it, it started letting out ear-splitting shrieks. I had the impression that it wasn't an adult and that it was calling for help. Loud noises started coming from nearby. There was something else that was there, something else present in the immediate area, and it was rushing through the woods beyond where I could see. But I could tell it was coming closer. I ran away as fast as I could, seeing what I did and then hearing it shriek. All that was both surprising and scary enough. What was more alarming was hearing the other noises and realizing that something else was coming closer. With the one I saw being as big as it already was, I wouldn't think it had any need to call for help. Since it did, and if it really wasn't an adult, 
Then, no doubt, something even bigger was on its way. And I didn't want to be around there for that. On to the next one. The following encounters are records of wild man accounts that come from the turn of the century that share a striking resemblance to modern-day Bigfoot and Sasquatch accounts. Some years ago, there was considerable talk about a strange animal said to have been seen in the southwestern part of Bridgewater. Although the individual who described the animal persisted in declaring that he had seen it, the story was heard and looked upon as more as food for the marvelous than having any foundation in fact. He represented the animal as we have thought a third person, as having the appearance of a child seven or eight years old, though somewhat slimmer, and covered entirely with hair. He saw it while picking berries, walking toward him erect and whistling like a person. After recovering from the fright, he is said to have pursued it, but it ran off with such speed, whistling as it went, that he could not catch it. He said it ran like the devil and continued to call it after that name. The same or a similar looking animal was seen in Silver Lake Township by a boy of some 16 years old. We had the story from the father of the boy in his absence and afterward from the boy himself. The boy was sent to work in the backwoods near the New York state line. He took with him a gun and was told by his father to shoot anything he might see except persons or cattle. After working a while, he heard some person, a little brother as he supposed, coming towards him, whistling quite merrily. It came within a few rods of him and stopped. He said it looked like a human being covered with black hair about the size of his brother who was six or seven years old. His gun was some little distance off and he was very much frightened. He, however, got to his gun and shot at the animal but trembled so that he could not hold still. The strange animal, just as his gun went off, stepped behind a tree and then ran off whistling as before. The father said the boy came home very much frightened. When thinking about the animal he had seen, he would, to use his own words, burst out crying. Making due allowances for fright and consequent exaggeration, an animal of singular appearance has doubtless been seen. What it is, or whence it came from, is of course yet a mystery. From the description, if an orangutan were known to be in this country, we might think this to be it, as no such animal is known without vouching for the correctness of the story. We shall leave the listener to conjecture or guess for himself what it is. For the sake of a name, however, we call the strange animal the whistling wild boy of the woods. On to the next one. In Lancaster, Pennsylvania, a thing like a man but hairy as a bear has been seen frequently by the people. It is very wild and strong. It was once seen in a cow pen sucking the cows and when discovered, it started as if about to fight, then turned and fled, bounding like a deer. It walks upright and is supposed to be a wild man On to the next one. A wild man has been discovered in a forest in Clearfield County. He was covered all over with a copper colored down and, when captured, was able to speak only one word, craft. He had forgotten all the rest of the English language. Ex-Governor Bigler took the wild man in his hands and will prepare him to vote for the Democratic candidate in October. On to the next one. A wild woman, Gebertsville, Somerset County, Pennsylvania, claimed the sensation of the week. It has a genuine, Simon Pure wild woman, almost as nude as was Eve after the fall, for she wears only an apron of leaves, sandals of bark, and a necklace of tea berries, swift as a doe. People have rarely been able to see her features distinctly in her visit to the neighboring farmhouses 
and outskirts of the village. Yet, those who have seen her declare that she is far from uncomely in person and countenance. Her oval face is set with keen black eyes and framed in long masses of flowing black hair, and with her tall, slender figure, she has the air of the queen of the forest. Like most women, she has a great dread of men and bounds away over fences and fields whenever one attempts to approach her. Yet she is consistent and avoids, in like manner, too great familiarity with women. For children, however, she seems to have great fondness, as was exemplified only a few days past. While passing near the house of a farmer, she espied a little girl three or four years old playing in the road. Crouching, she crawled behind a fence until within a short distance of the child, then with a bound cleared the fence, in the next moment seized the screaming little one and was away at the top of her speed. The mother, hearing the screams of her child, pursued, screaming yet more loudly. Her husband, attracted by the cries of both, hastened to the chase. The wild woman, finding herself encumbered by the weight of the child, dropped it and escaped. The latter was uninjured, with the exception of some scratches, which no doubt are attributed to the long nails of the strange denizen of the field and forest. On to the next one. Considerable excitement prevails among the different parties frequenting the mountains in search of berries five miles west of Harrisburg and directly opposite Rockville. Not long since John Quincy Adams, of the latter place, while at his leisure, was in pursuit of berries, and, having wandered a considerable distance into the mountains, became terribly alarmed at the appearance of a man supposed to be perfectly wild, and going about in a condition that, according to description, would be sufficient to put to flight the boldest backwoodsman. At least the sight of the human monster was too much for Quincy, who vacated the ground with the speed of a flying buffalo. He never ventured to cast a look behind, but leaping the smaller bushes, dodging overhanging trees, losing his hat, and relieving himself of his bucket, he very rapidly increased the distance twixt him and his starting point, with the dreaded terror a considerable way in the rear, a bellowing out his wild yells of triumph but losing ground in the pursuit by the remarkably rapid strides of the venerable Quincy. He soon found himself in sight of the cozy little village where an elderly lady's mansion he might find relief, and as was necessary, a camphor stimulant. He has not been to gather berries since, and no further developments of the mystery have been gained, save that two of the telegraph operations of which there are four employed in the place by the different R&R &R companies, saw fit one day to rusticate among the shady trees and dispatch any whortleberries that might fall in their way, and finding themselves a small distance outside the bounds of safety and hearing the calls of their instruments when they were startled suddenly by some unusual noises, and after reconnoitering some little with a view to find out why and wherefore in which they failed. They convened and held a council of war and concluded to quit the place. On to the next one. John Worms, the cryptozoologist, fell down the unknown animal rabbit hole as he researched strange tunnels found along the banks of rivers and streams. Native people told him that giant snakes lived in those tunnels, so he began to collect tales of these snakes. This made sense to him. He had ruled out running water as the cause of the tunnels, so he was left to wonder what animals might make an elliptical tunnel with perfectly smooth sides. Also, what burrowing animal was big enough to produce a tunnel three feet high and just as wide? The First Nations people he spoke to told him straight-faced that the tunnels were often excavated by giant beavers. The creatures were not often seen, his informant said, but might be identified 
by lodges and dams as big as human dwellings, the rumbling of the ground underfoot as they dug, and a whistling sound. As with the giant snakes, Warns began to ask after giant beaver stories in his many forays into reserves in Manitoba. Again, as with the enormous snake encounters, witnesses were plentiful. In the spring of 2006, a goose hunter from South Indian was following the wooded shore of a lake when he was shocked to see a huge beaver in front of him. Its size was so intimidating that he didn't dare challenge it with a shotgun. So he slowly retreated and watched as it went down the bank into the water. The native people of Canada often hunt, trap, and fish to supplement their income and put food on the table. This young man was out for goose and he certainly would have known what a beaver looked like. His reaction to the size of this beaver gives us some indication of how enormous these beavers really are. Illustrations and estimates of the giant beaver's size put these oversized numbers at something approaching the size of a black bear and standing as high as a man's shoulder when they sit up. A lady from Nelson House tells this story. She and another woman were picking cranberries on a steep slope beside a lake when something suddenly jumped over them from above and hastened to the water below in a clumsy, waddling fashion. At about the same time, another bear-sized creature skirted where they stood frozen and also made for the shore and disappeared into the water. Berry picking was over, and not just for the day. Again, these are people who are familiar with the fauna of the area and know what a bear looks like. The witnesses made a point of telling Worms that the animal dove underwater, something a bear does not do, and pointing out that the old people in the community took it for granted that there were big beavers in the area. Unlike normal-sized beavers, it seems that the giant beaver might supplement their diet with fish. One account came from a family. They lived on the high bank a footprint lake which surrounds the community of Nelson House. In the fall of 2006, the family watched in awe as an unusual creature appeared in the water below them for about half an hour. Its 13 to 15 inch diameter head would be visible for 5 to 10 minutes at a time as it swam looking around. And then it would disappear. That is, when fish would begin jumping out of the water, like reverse rain, dozens at a time. Then its head would reappear for a while, and when it dove down again, the fish would begin jumping again. Never before had they seen or heard such a thing. In the summer of 2008, a young man from Nelson House shared his story. He and a carload of young people had been motoring to the northern Manitoba city some years ago when he spotted a large beaver up ahead on the side of the road. He had stopped, grabbed a baseball bat, and commented that he was going to get supper. As he approached the creature, he realized that it was much larger than an ordinary beaver. And about that time, it had gone on the offensive and started after him. He had barely managed to escape into the car, and the other occupants had told him that it had taken huge jumps behind him. Worms was in contact with researcher Carl Schulker, who had suggested to Worms that the giant beavers might be relic examples of Castiorolide oensis, a giant beaver native to North America, but thought to be extinct for more than 10,000 years. Worms decided in April of 2006 to camp on the shores of the Asibone River. He did not really expect to see a giant beaver, but since there had been reports in the area, he had a vague hope that he might. His hopes were borne out. And here is a quote of his description of the event. But then, something came into view directly in front of me, and my eyes fastened on something that matched my dreams. I gawked in disbelief. A large form appeared 
clearly on the surface of the water. Even though small twigs and branches came between, instinctively, I bent down to gain better perspective, and as I did so, the large head went down, and the distinctive slap of a beaver's tail followed. I was shocked. Had I really seen it? This was almost too surreal to be true. I pondered the incident, not only all evening, but also for weeks and months, asking myself if I really saw a giant beaver. What did I see? The part that stands out in my mind is the big head, at least the size of a basketball. Behind the head, the animal's back was also above the water, and behind that, something else, presumably the tail. One long glance was all the time I had, not enough to pick out any details. The overall length was incredible, seven to eight feet. It seemed to float with the current, which moved faster than a walk. The creature must have seen me standing there, and in fact probably had been spying on me all along, and surfaced to get a better look. And in those brief moments, I also got a look, and will be forever grateful. Something is digging the great smooth-sided tunnels that started Warm's initial investigation, even more credible than the idea of a giant beaver species roaming the wilds of Manitoba is the thought that a moose might live underwater. According to Worms, however, the Cree actually have a word for such an animal. It is called Itam Pigu Mu Soa, the underwater moose. According to Worms, these animals are stockier than air-breathing moose with shorter legs and a sagging stomach. The animal has cloven hooves of a regular moose, but there is an abundance of hair around the hooves. The antlers of the underwater moose tend to be branchier than their land-dwelling cousin. The underwater moose also seems to have flaps or folds under its chin that many theorize may help it breathe underwater. There are many examples of hunters who have run into these creatures and fired on them with no result. The animal simply disappears under the water and is gone. This is not a behavior that the air-breathing moose engages in. These giant undulates do swim, but they do it with their head above the water. A strange incident that happened to the Spence family while they were fishing the Minarski Lakes north of Nelson House. Conrad Spence, his spouse Veronica, and a helper named Henry Wood were lifting nets on West Minarski Lake when Veronica heard a noise like an animal gasping for air. They spotted antlers, but oddly, the animal had appeared in the middle of the lake, not come from shore, as most creatures would. Given low provisions, these commercial fishers saw this as an opportunity to fill their meat stores. There was a considerable struggle, requiring both men to tie a net line to the antlers of this animal. The sharp trines of the antlers posed a threat to the aluminum boat, but after several tries, the group was successful in securing the creature. Drowning a moose by keeping its head underwater was an age-old method for acquiring meat when gun or axe was not available in the canoe or boat. The Spences and Wood dragged this moose, but it refused to drown. In a minute or two, as did a normal moose, but instead took much longer. Maybe the beast only drowned because it was being pulled along underwater and was forced to process more water than normal. Once the creature had finally succumbed, the group drew it to shore and recruited help from camp to get it out of the water. It took 13 people on four ropes to draw this animal from the lake, a job that normally only required three to four people. The moose was very different from an ordinary moose and matched the description with the strange antlers, short legs, drooping belly, and hair-covered feet. This creature also seemed to have a head smaller than a normal moose, more pointed ears, and odd colors of brown on its back and black on the rest of the way down. The fisher folk also noticed the scarf that ran the length of the lower jaw, which some surmise is its underwater breathing apparatus. Once the creature had been butchered for meat, the group noted, the fat was described as more yellowish than the usual white, 
with even a purplish tinge. The meat had been good. Conrad and Veronica insisted that the meat didn't have the savor of typical moose meat, but was rich and tasty, and eaten three times a day until it was all gone. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!